They dedicate their lives to protecting those in need and stopping those who seek to harm others, risking their lives daily and sometimes making the ultimate sacrifice. In this video, we'll uncover five tragic stories of police officers who lost their lives in the line of duty. Each story is equally disturbing and heart-wrenching. Join us as we honor their memories and keep their stories alive. Just after 11 p.m. on August 15, 2019, Police Constables Andrew Harper and Andrew Shaw finished their shifts when Thames Valley Police received a 999 call. Harper and Shaw were actually on their way home. They didn't have to respond, but they decided to do it anyway. The call came from a property in Berkshire, UK. A burglary was underway. A group was trying to steal a 10,000-pound quad bike. The two police constables started driving to the location, hoping to stop the thieves and return the quad bike to its rightful owner. At 28 years old, Andrew Harper was a respected police constable. He was kind and selfless, doing everything in his power to help. Harper was newly married to the love of his life, Lissy, and was looking forward to their honeymoon in the Maldives later that month. He had no idea that responding to this call would forever change his and Lissy's lives. At about 11.28 p.m. that night, police constables Andrew Harper and Andrew Shaw came across a seat Toledo vehicle driving towards them on Admore Lane, a narrow street. They noticed straight away that the car was towing a quad bike. They also saw that one of the suspects was outside the vehicle, trying to unhitch the motorcycle, most likely because they wanted to ditch the Honda TRX 500 quad bike and quickly exit. It is possible that Harper and Shaw were surprised to see that the suspects were teenagers, but these weren't typical teenagers. They were thieves who had meticulously planned this burglary. Hours before, 19-year-old Henry Long and 18-year-olds Jesse Cole and Albert Bowers turned off their car's rear lights and taped over the number plate. They then drove to the quad bike's location, masked and armed with an axe and crowbars, ready to take out anyone in their way. But the quad bike owner saw the three teenagers taking it and roping its handlebars to the back of their vehicle. He was the one to make the call that police constables Andrew Harper and Andrew Shaw answered. Harper and Shaw now encountered the teenage suspects. They saw 18-year-old Cole unhitching the bike. Andrew Harper quickly got out of the police car and ran to the suspect's vehicle, trying to stop them from getting away. But Cole saw him and quickly dived through a passenger window. The rope they'd used to tow the quad bike was still attached to their car. In a cruel twist of fate, unwittingly, Andrew Harper stepped with both feet into the trailing tow strap becoming essentially lassos to the suspect's vehicle. 19-year-old Henry Long, the trio's leader, was also the designated driver for this nefarious endeavor. He long sped off, driving at up to 60 miles per hour. Andrew Harper was trapped, swinging like a pendulum behind the speeding car. He was most likely rendered unconscious as soon as he hit the road, thus becoming unable to free himself from the rope. In the meantime, Andrew Shaw rushed to help Harper, but eventually lost sight of the suspect's car. But he did find Harper's stab vest in the road. After about a mile of being dragged behind the car at breakneck speed, Andrew Harper was disentangled from the moving vehicle. Some other colleagues found him on the road. His police uniform had been ripped and stripped from his body by the high-speed journey. Harper was dead, having suffered horrific injuries. His death came as a shock to his friends, family, and colleagues. But the shock only became more incredible when the three teenagers were eventually apprehended and brought to trial. Long, Cole, and Bowers were seen laughing and joking at the trial. Bowers even fell asleep as the prosecutor showed footage of Harper's demise. The prosecutor tried to show that the three suspects had intended to kill Andrew Harper by speeding off instead of stopping the vehicle. The jury, however, acquitted all three defendants of murder, but found them guilty of manslaughter. In the wake of Andrew's tragic demise, his wife, Lissy Harper, campaigned vigorously for Harper's Law. This law mandates life sentences for anyone convicted of the manslaughter of an on-duty emergency worker. Enacted in 2022, the law did not impact the sentences of Long, Cole, and Bowers. Metro Nashville Police Department Officer Eric Mumaw loved the night shift. The 44-year-old was an 18-year veteran of the force, but this didn't prevent him from volunteering to take the night shift whenever he could. February 2, 2017 was no different. Eric was on duty when the Emergency Communication Center received a call at 4.16 a.m. 
The call came from a family member of a woman named Julie Glisson. According to this person, 40-year-old Julie was in her car, on the boat ramp at the edge of the Cumberland River, threatening to end her own life. Julie had a history of self-harm attempts. This time around, her relative was worried Julie was going to succeed. They needed someone to go and prevent her from taking her own life. Eric Mumaw responded to the call. Officers Nick Diamond and Trent Craig joined him. Together, the three men rushed to the scene. In cases like these, every second matters. Eric Mumaw was no stranger to helping people in even dire situations. Throughout his career, he helped everyone from abducted babies to victims of violent attacks or even people experiencing homelessness. He was the kind of person who always went the extra mile, and his efforts didn't go unnoticed. In 2003, Eric received the department's Exemplary Service Award. He was decorated again in 2011 when he received the department's Life-Saving Award. The police officers quickly arrived at the scene. They saw the car parked at the bottom of the Peeler Park Greenway Trailhead boat ramp at the edge of the Cumberland River, a significant waterway. Its waters are deep. Given the time of year, they were also bound to be icy and unforgiving. The three men split up. Officer Nick Diamond approached the car from the passenger side, while officers Eric Mumaw and Trent Craig came from the driver's side. 40-year-old Julie Glisson was sitting behind the wheel. They started talking to the woman, trying to get her to reconsider and leave the car. The situation was tense because the officer knew Julie could put the car into gear any time. They talked for about 10 minutes. Officer Trent Craig slowly reached in, trying to prevent Julie from putting the car into gear. Meanwhile, Eric Muma attempted to open the door because it seemed that Julie would get out of the car after all. That's when the car started moving, heading toward the icy waters of the Cumberland River. It all happened in a flash. As Eric Muma and Nick Diamond tried to grab the car, both men lost their balance. The vehicle started submerging, dragging the two men with it. The car and the ensuing powerful current pulled them further into the river. The water was indeed icy. It was mayhem. After a while, though, Nick Diamond somewhat regained control. He saw Eric struggling to stay above the water and drifting further into the river. Nick reached for Eric, but his grip wasn't firm enough. He lost it, and Eric drifted away. Meanwhile, Officer Trent Craig saw Eric getting carried away by the river. Trent ran along the riverbank. Then he spotted the top of Eric's head. Trent wasted no second, plunged into the cold water which came up to his neck. He tried to swim and reach Eric, but the cold and the extreme conditions overcame his body. Trent knew he had to escape the river to survive, so he did. Nick Diamond and Trent Craig called for help. Julie Glisson had managed to get out of the water some time before. Eric Mumaw's body was recovered by a rescue dive team some five hours after he was swept away at 9 a.m. that morning. He was found less than 100 yards away from the boat ramp. Julie Glisson was charged with vehicular homicide by intoxication and pleaded guilty. She was sentenced to serve 12 years and barred from driving for 10 years. Eric Muma was not married and had no children. Family, friends, and colleagues mourned him, and hundreds of officers traveled from multiple states to attend his memorial. It was February 2nd, 2023. Julian Becerra, a Colorado officer with the Fountain Police Department, was on duty when he and multiple other officers were asked to assist the Department of Corrections in tracking down three carjacking suspects. 31-year-old Devin Bobian, 37-year-old Anthony Vallejos, and 28-year-old Denisha Pacheco. At 35 years old, Julian Becerra was a U.S. Air Force veteran who'd served with the Fountain Police Department for four and a half years. Julian was assigned to the patrol division as a K-9 officer. He was experienced, having previously served with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office, first as a security technician and then as a deputy sheriff. Not only was Julian a brave and dedicated police officer, but he was also a proud father of two. He had a son and a daughter. On February 2nd, Julian responded to the call. What followed was a movie-like car chase. Around 5.30 p.m. that day, several officers spotted the stolen car, a Hyundai out of Pueblo, Colorado near North Academy Boulevard and Platte Avenue. They identified the suspects, Bobian, Vallejos, and Pacheco, and pursued them. It was clear the three suspects were reckless. They were driving erratically, often driving the wrong way down lanes. It was a dangerous situation and the suspects, especially Devin Bobian, were harmful. Bobian was a four-time convicted felon and an escapee. 
Two months before, Bobian escaped from a community correction site in Pueblo. At some point during the chase, the suspect stopped at Love's Travel Center in Fountain. The three exited the stolen Hyundai and approached a silver Toyota 4Runner in the parking lot. They intended to steal the Toyota and have police lose their trail. One of the suspects approached the car's owner, a woman just about to pump gas. He had a gun. He pointed the muzzle at the woman, demanding her keys and asking her to empty her pockets. Meanwhile, the other two entered her vehicle, waiting for their partner to get the keys. But the woman refused to give over her keys. Instead, she started to walk away. She then turned around and told them to get out of her car. The police were getting closer. When they arrived at Love's Travel Center, the suspects ran back into the Hyundai they had entered and sped away. Just before 8 p.m., though, the Fountain Police Department utilized a tactical vehicle intervention technique to stop the suspects, pinning the vehicle between two police cars. One of the police cars belonged to Julian Becerra. They were on a bridge near South Academy Boulevard and South Hartford Street in Colorado Springs. Julian exited the car, ready to arrest the suspects, but stuck between his vehicle and the bridge guardrail. At the same time, Devin Bobian exited his car. He had to escape. He climbed on the roof of the stolen Hyundai and then leaped on the hood of Julian's car. With Julian Becerra stuck between the car and the guardrail, Bobian should have grabbed the chance and started running away from the police. Instead, the man stopped and turned his attention to Julian. He turned toward the officer standing over him and leaned forward threateningly. Bobian pointed toward Julian, a terrifying gesture that caused Julian Becerra to fall over the guardrail, plummeting 40 feet from the bridge. That's when Bobian attempted to flee by foot, but he was detained shortly after. He fought a lot, and while being handcuffed, Bobian managed to crawl toward the edge of the bridge. He was stopped before he could jump and taken into custody. Julian Becerra was airlifted to the hospital. He was put on life support on Friday, February 10th, but ultimately succumbed to his multiple injuries and died the next day, nine days after the incident. Devin Bobian was found guilty in Julian Becerra's death and was charged with second-degree murder, vehicular eluding, motor vehicle theft, weapon possession by a previous offender, and two counts of aggravated robbery for his actions in the February 2nd car chase. On August 24, 2023, Sergeant Graham Saville was at work. Graham, who began his policing career with the Metropolitan Police in 2013, joined Nottinghamshire Police in 2017. He was based at Newark Police Station and recently became a response sergeant. Graham, who was 46 years old and a father of two, loved his job. His wanting to make a difference was what led him to become a police officer in the first place. To those who knew him, family and colleagues alike, Graham was the epitome of what a police officer should be. He was empathetic, kind, funny and compassionate. His peers greatly respected him because he loved helping and developing younger officers. He was the one who always ensured the team was coping with some of the more challenging incidents. That Thursday, just before 7 p.m., the Nottinghamshire police received a call from a residential area in Balderton, one of the largest villages in Nottinghamshire, England. The call was made over concerns for a man's safety. Sergeant Graham Saville responded to the call. When he arrived at the scene, Graham noticed a man in distress. The man, who appeared younger than Graham, was on the railway line near Newark Northgate Station. He needed help and being on the railway line made the situation even more stressful. Any approaching train was bound to become a problem, but Graham Saville was a dutiful police officer. He was also selfless and brave, ready to face any danger to save another person. Graham approached the man and tried to help him, but his attempt was cut short when he was struck by a train. People watched the highly traumatic incident in horror. Graham Saville was taken to the hospital, having suffered severe injuries. The other man, who was 29 years old, was also taken to the hospital with electricity-induced injuries, which were deemed non-life-threatening. Between the two of them, Graham was by far in a graver condition. Five days after the incident, he succumbed to his injuries and died at Queen's Medical Center, surrounded by his family and loved ones. Graham's death was described as a selfless sacrifice. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak called his ultimate sacrifice a testament to his bravery. At 5.57 p.m. on May 5, 2024, the Utah Highway Patrol received a worrying call from a concerned traffic participant. The caller claimed a person was standing on the back of a semi-trailer. 
Sergeant Bill Hooser, 50, was stationed at an I-15 median in Santa Quin, Utah, when he noticed a white truck matching the description given by the caller. Bill Hooser was a police officer who truly loved his job. He started as a volunteer before joining the Santa Quin City Police Department in 2017. Bill was also recently promoted from corporal to sergeant in February 2024. He loved serving the community he called home and helping people in need. Bill followed the truck off the freeway. The 911 call from the concerned driver had made it seem like someone needed assistance, but the truck driver ran a stop sign and even attempted to enter the freeway again. That's when Sergeant Bill Hooser managed to pull the car over, assisted by Utah Highway Patrol Trooper Dustin Griffiths. The two police officers approached the truck to speak with the driver and determine the issue. The driver, Michael Aaron Jane, was initially uncooperative and refused to answer their questions. The officers assured him they were there to help and that he wasn't in trouble. This reassurance eventually led Jane to hand over the truck's digital log to Dustin Griffiths. But as the trooper was checking the document, something strange happened. A woman jumped out of the passenger door. She was obviously in distress. She sprinted to the back of the trailer and around the other side. Her hands were up. What the officers didn't know was that Michael Aaron Jane had essentially kidnapped the woman hours earlier. Initially, she had been voluntarily riding with him, but an argument erupted when they stopped at a truck stop in Beaver, Utah. Jane decided to abandon her and drove off without her, only to return several times, pleading for her to come back. When she refused, Jane became enraged, threatening her with a knife and bear spray, coercing her to re-enter the vehicle. As soon as the woman jumped out of the truck, Sergeant Bill Hooser started walking back to the semi-truck, gesturing to Trooper Dustin Griffiths that they needed to get Jane out of the vehicle and detain him. But Michael Jane had entirely different plans. The trucker locked the door and drove off. Bill and Dustin started running to their cars, their backs now to the truck. Bill Hooser didn't see it coming until the very last minute. He didn't see Jane making a sharp U-turn, coming straight at him until the last moment. Bill tried in vain to move away from his car door jam, out of the path of the speeding truck. But there was no time. The truck's grill and bumper smashed Bill's body into one of the patrol cars. Sergeant Bill Hooser was killed instantly, but Michael Jane didn't plan to stop. Instead, he gunned the truck toward Trooper Dustin Griffiths and the woman, and he would have hit them too were it not for the woman. She saw the car coming and warned Dustin. They both jumped and ran from the path of the oncoming vehicle. Jane fled the scene, then pulled over and ran off the freeway. He managed to evade police for a while, stealing multiple vehicles, but officers caught up near Vernal, where they performed a maneuver that stopped him. Jane went off the road and crashed. He sustained severe injuries and was transported to the hospital. Michael Jane faces charges of aggravated murder, attempted aggravated murder, and attempted kidnapping.